I took it upon myself to go visit some bike shops wherever I raced in, you know, in the, in North America and showed them the bike and let them ride it. And, and the, the soft ride folks noticed that and said, well, why don't you stop racing and be our sales manager? So, you know, I didn't really realize I would, I could be good at sales, mm -hmm. but it was that, you know, I, I love talking to people and, you know, having that, you know, building that relationship and which, you know, it's, it's not everything about sales, but it certainly is a start, you know, being, being able to cold call and essentially, right. This episode of the Smart Athlete Podcast is brought to you by Solpre. If you're active at all, whether you're running or simply out walking for the day, you've probably experienced one of the number one problems that active people have, and that's chafing. Solpre's all new, all natural anti-chafe balm solves that problem while feeding your skin the vital nutrients it needs to be healthy. If you'd like to stop chafing once and for all and treat your body right, Go to Solpri.com to check out the anti-chafe balm today. And that's S-O-L-P-R-I.com. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today, um, like many of my guests, has a laundry list of accomplishments we could talk about. So I'm going to get the Cliff Snows version. And then during the entirety of this conversation, I'm sure we're going to get more into the nitty gritty. He's a former pro cyclist, an Olympian, the first North American to wear the leader's jersey in the Tour de France. He's a current IT pro. We're going to figure out how he went from cycling to IT. Welcome to the show, Alex Stita. Great to be here, Jesse. Before we got going, um, we were talking about this. Alex, thanks for taking time out of your day. Uh, uh, I, unlike many people, uh, this is part of my job, though this is just recreation for you. So I appreciate you taking part of your work day to spend time with me and us, the listener. Um, I, I know it can be tough, especially as we were talking about all the back to back to back zoom meetings, everybody's on nowadays and trying to like be on time. So thank you so much for, you know, taking time out of your day with, with us here. Yeah. And Jesse, thanks for having me. It's uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it seems like uh, during this uh, weird time of our lives, uh, there, there's more expectation in during the work week to get more work done just because you can and uh and yeah there's no there's no time to drive to customer sites and and a face-to-face -face coffees and things which i really miss actually yeah but uh yeah it, it's just a it's a weird time it's it's kind of a it's good and bad in the sense that i think it helps us think a little more creatively about one what does work look like and how can we accomplish that in the sense that a lot of people were really stuck on this. We all have to be in the office. It's like things can be a little more flexible than that. But as you mentioned, the downside being that now people think you need to be on 100% of the time, which I don't think is realistic for like the human attention span. Yeah, and and it's it's very it's very challenging. Um, and it's not just you know nine to five. You know, it's because we're dealing with um, you know, I have subject matter experts that I'm calling in from around the world mm -hmm. to talk to my customers. So sometimes, you know, uh, you know, I've got people in India, so I've got to have a meeting at 830 at night. Yeah. You know, uh, which, you know, five, 10 years ago, no one would have thought that that you'd have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. So I, I guess we're going to get into the cycling for sure. But before we get there, I, I I have to ask, how do you get from pro cyclist to IT pro? Like what was, was it always an interest? Like what, what's the transition? How, how did that occur? Well, it, it almost by osmosis, I'm going to say. Um, when I retired from racing in 1992, uh, I had been racing, you know, for about half my life. I was 31 years old and, uh, and I, you know, wasn't sure what to do, but in the last couple of years of racing, I was riding for the soft ride bicycle company. We had, you know, the, what we, you know, what we, you know, affectionately called the beam bike. Mm -hmm. It had a carbon fiber beam that supported the saddle. And uh, so I raced on that and I took it upon myself to go visit some bike shops wherever I raced in, you know, in, the, in North America and showed them the bike and let them ride it. And, and the, the soft ride folks noticed that and said, well, why don't you stop racing and be our sales manager? So, 
you know, I didn't really realize I would, I could be good at sales, mm -hmm. but it was that, you know, I, I love talking to people and, you know, having that, you know, building that relationship and which, you know, it's, it's not everything about sales, but it certainly is a start, you know, being, being able to cold call and essentially, right. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, you know, we moved my family to Bellingham, Washington. And for five years, I was the sales manager for a bicycle company, just, just by, you know, again, osmosis, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, you know, we wanted to, you know, raise our kids in Canada. So we moved back to Edmonton where my wife is from, um, you know, without any job prospects. And it turned out my brother-in-law worked at a software startup here in Edmonton, Alberta. And uh, he said, yeah, they think they're, they're looking for some sales guys. Alex, you know, why don't you go meet the, the, one of the owners? So I, I went and, you know, sat down and met with him. I didn't, you know, this was 1997. I barely knew how to type. Okay. okay. I was 36, 35, 36 years old. I didn't even know what a URL was. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, I would just, you've been living, living in the stone age, essentially as a pro cyclist back then, you know, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have, you know, there wasn't sort of, uh, you know, internet connections, you know, you didn't walk, you don't, you didn't travel around well, with like, a modem. Right. You know? Not, not training with power with a computer. Oh, and Oh no, no. I mean, <laughs> they're, 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 yeah, they're, uh, SRMs were, were out there, but they were very, very hard to find. And, and you yeah. know, we didn't even know how to use, you know, if we had one, we didn't even know how to use them. Um, so yeah. So I met, uh, I met the owner of, uh, the software company. He said, yeah, we'll give you a try. <laughs> so again, there I was, you know, in this industry, I had nothing, knew nothing about, did, a, you know, started doing some research and, but it was more about, you know, being able to just put yourself out there and cold call mm -hmm. and, and talk to people, understand what their needs and priorities were or challenges and, and see if you could find a fit, you know, with, with the, with the solution offering that we had. So it just grew from there, <laughs> just, you know, totally unplanned. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, I've been able to make a, a you know, a good living in, in the IT space for the last 25 years. It's always, you know, it, sometimes I, I say this often on the podcast, it's like, it's easy to, to put the story together looking backwards. It's like, okay, but then looking forwards, you try to go, where am I going? And I think sometimes that the uncertainty of life, or in your case, like, not knowing that you would end up there. I think some people want to make this like grand plan, of, you know, that co that classic interview question, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Right, like, right, right, like, right, right. like, I don't know, like life changes. What do you mean where do I see myself in 10 yeah. years? I'm going to, I'm going to ride the wave and see what happens. But I think that uncertainty is, is difficult to live with. However, if you can, I think you can find yourself in like really interesting spots because you take advantage of those opportunities you didn't know were around the corner. Yeah. I mean, I've always loved setting goals for myself. Don't get me wrong. I'm just not going through life going, okay, well, whatever comes, comes, you know, but you know, setting goals is, is super important, whether they're, you know, you know, short midterm goals for this year, next year, or, you know, longer term goals, you know, but, you know, I've always been able, I think to, recognize, you know, recognize opportunities when they come along and be able to pivot. And I, I, I take that back to, you know, how I, I raced as a, as a, as a professional cyclist mm -hmm. and you could like in, in a bike race, you could prescribe everything down to the nth degree. Okay. You, this is going to happen. You're going to get in the early break. You're going to stick it out and you're going to be the last guy to attack from the break. And then finally get to, you know, you know maybe, you know, be able to solo to the finish before the Peloton catches you, but it, you can't plan like that. Right. A bike race is, is like a, a, a moving story. And it, right. you know, the, the story is evolving as the race goes on. Now, granted nowadays with the race radios, the guys use, and the, you know, there, there's, there's more control of the race from the directors in the team car. And it's a little bit more predictable, mm -hmm. but there's still an element of, of, uh, of the storyline that, that can change. But, you know, back in the 80s, it was definitely more about thinking on your feet and be able to read the race and what I call feel the moment. Mm -hmm. When you feel the moment when the, when the right time is to attack or accelerate or make your move, right? But that, that's a gut instinct that mm -hmm. you learn and acquire with right. experience. And I, I found that that's, the, you know, I've, I've, I've applied that to the rest of my life, essentially. Yeah. 
So is this, do you think that, you know, now that, I, I guess a short way is, even though you're an IT, IT guy now, has technology ruined cycling? Is it, have we, have we taken that, that guts element out so much that it's more, it really is more of a calculated thing or is, should we, should we say, all right, now we're abandoning race radios. We're like, you power meters, we're part of the power meters. Like you yeah. can't, you gotta just go on guts alone. Should, should, you know, should, may, well, with the tour, tour of Alberta, are we, are you going to like say, Hey, we're going, we're going low tech only and going to offer like a weird <laughs> classic race. Well, I mean, yeah, we, I mean, for the Tour of Alberta, which is a professional cycling race, which I helped run for five years, you know, we had, we had uh, individual time trials in, in the stage race. Mm -hmm. And we said to the teams, don't bring your time trial bikes. Okay. You'll do the time trials on your regular road bikes. Right. And, you know, that helped the teams too, because then, you know, their, their costs of, you know, travel and all the extra yeah, bikes. Yeah, all the equipment. Yeah. You know, a lot of them were flying in, not driving. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it just it made a lot of sense that way. But, yeah, you know what, what? When the race radios first came out and became more prevalent, I was adamantly against radios. I was like almost screaming from the rooftops. Whoever, whoever would listen, you know, like yeah, there really weren't podcasts back back then. But right, you know, uh, over time, you know, I've I've come, you know, uh, you know, especially working in IT, you 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 become you come to realize that change is inevitable, mm -hmm. right? And if you don't adapt and accept change. You know, you're, you're just going to, you're going to fade into oblivion, right? So, you know, I, I think there's, there, there certainly are a lot of reasons, uh, good reasons for race radios and power meters. You know, it helps the athlete, you know, it, you know, the power meters certainly help athletes become, you know, very specific with their training and maximize their performance. Yeah, otherwise, you're just sort of, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're, you're training in the dark, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. Without a power meter and a heart rate monitor. Um, now glucose monitors are coming, becoming more prevalent too, right? Yeah. It goes on from there, but you know, you're maximizing human performance. That's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. The race radios, you know, you, uh, you the races bec actually become safer, to be honest, you know, they're, um, and, and the, the race organization can relay through the team cars who then relay to the riders. If there's a situation on the road that, that, that they need to, you know, shut the race down. And case in point was the Tour de France a number of years ago when there was that mudslide, mm -hmm. no one knew what was going on, but because the team cars were, were listening to the, the race organization on that radio channel, they were able to, you know, tell the riders on their radios what was going on. And they, you know, they had to, you know, had to, you know cancel the stage early. Otherwise it would just be chaos guys. Would yeah. be like, you know, oh, I got to talk to the team car and they're in the mountains. So, you know, the, the team car can't follow every guy. Yeah. So anyway, you know, there, there's a lot of good reasons for race radios. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's actually quite, quite fun when you, you know, when you're watching video of the uh, directors in the team car mm -hmm. directing the riders, you'll see the, you know, the you know, little video, you know, cameras in the team car and they're talking to the riders and giving them instruction. And, you know, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's an interesting uh, way that the, the, you know, pro cycling has evolved and I, I'm good with it now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I would think so given you, that you just espouse the philosophy that, you know, you have to change and change is inevitable. Um, I, I kind of think about that situation of like seeing like the, the team directors, you know, giving their uh, like directions to the riders sort of similar to, um, so, uh, we have a soccer team here, Sporting Kansas City, and we have a very, uh, animated coach on the sideline, uh, always dressed well, but he yells and stuff and you get, you know, you get the like things that he's yelling at the players yeah. and you can see how the formation change. I kind of see like the similarity there where it's like, you get the coach's direction and then you watch how, you know, the writers in this case, instead of players like react to what the suggestion or direction is to, mm -hmm. you know, move forward, hold back, you know, get your pace line going, whatever it is. It, it's like, it, it adds another layer of depth to watching the sport, I think. Yeah. And so you, you could argue that, you know, the, you know, that, you know, the, the riders become more like robots. Mm -hmm. you know, they're just being told what to do. And right. They have to think for themselves. Right. <clears throat> uh, but you know, it, 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 you could, you could certainly take that position, but I think, you know, any, any, um, 
any business, whether it's a sporting team or, you know, a, uh, you know, uh, you know, an IT organization needs to have coordination and, you know, command and control and, you know, all, all, to maximize the, the efficiency of, of the team that's mm-hmm. working, whether it's in business or in sport. Um, so it just, it just, it, it's, it's a good thing. Um, and it's something that, uh, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the diehards have to just get over, I think, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's, 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 it's fun to watch. And it does add this element, of course, that, you know, uh, that, that, uh, of, of, of strategy. And I think we're, we're, you know, as, as a fan, you're able to see more about the strategy that's unfolding mm-hmm. because of the cameras that they're putting in the cars and allowing people to hear what the directors are saying to the riders. So, yeah, right. I think it's, it's good all around. Yeah, it's like I said, I, I think it's you get those bits and pieces where like for people like me who I, I would never be anywhere near a, a pro Peloton or even like Cat 1, Cat, I probably would ride like Cat 4 maybe, um, which is sorry, there's different categories of riders in cycling if you're not familiar, um, starting Cat 5, I think, and then all the way up to pros. Yep. Um, but, you know, like there are kind of my backgrounds in, in running and I think I have insights about running and triathlon to some some degree that like you're just not going to have if you haven't been able to compete at a high level I think that same thing is happening in cycling and then having that just small glimpse obviously you're not on the team bus you're not here and like the you know all the prep and stuff but yeah. you're getting like these little bits and pieces of info that you wouldn't have any other idea about if they weren't sharing it um one thing I want to ask you about that always just, I'm, I'm a terrible descender. I'll say that I, I just, maybe part of it's just, I've been on a time trial bake basically uh, for most of my riding, but I am absolutely terrible at descents. Uh, and I watch these guys bomb down the hills at, you know, 50, 60 miles an hour. They're not, you know, they're sitting on their top tube instead of sitting on the saddle. Well, they're not allowed to do that anymore. Okay. We stopped anyway, it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I was like, I've kind of, I've kind of peeled off watching the tour the last few years. Um, it, t- tell me about learning to do that. Mm-hmm. What, was everybody as aggressive when you were riding? Has that, did that like develop? Talk, talk to me about that, that situation. How do you learn to be a, a good descender? Cause it's. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, Jesse, that's, a, that's a great thought. You know, how, how did I learn to be a good descender and, and, you know, learn about the skills of cycling, you know, there's no um, prescribed, a way of teaching cycling skills. That's what I've learned over okay. the years. And that's been really frustrating for me. That's why I run, <laughs> I've, I've run my own skills camps um, for, for riders, you know, taking people to Europe or going, you know, to a nice location in North America and, and running skills camps. But it's, it's still frustrating because every, every ex pro uh, teaches the skills in a different way. Mm-hmm. So I took it upon myself to take a, uh, a downhill ski instructor's course. Okay. Now, here's the difference. In downhill skiing, they have a very prescribed method of teaching skiing skills to recreational skiers. Mm-hmm. But if you want to be a ski race, a racer, you don't take lessons from a, a skiing instructor. Right. You take lessons from a skiing coach who teaches race technique. Race technique in skiing is completely different than recreational skiing technique. The principles are the same, but Mm -hmm. it's it's radically different. So I took this in in a skiing instructor's course so I could, so uh, I, I just wanted to understand how they did it. This is back when I was still racing actually in the, in the mid eighties. And it, it, it was a really interesting, you know, they use a progressive teaching technique where you teach one, one part of the skill and then you, you master that. Then you add in another part. You do both together. You master that. Then you do stage one, the third stage. You do one, two, and three together. Master that. Repetition. Do it again. Okay. Now let's add on the fourth skill. And then you pretty soon you're doing the whole skill mm-hmm. after you've, but you've started with this really basic version of this, you know, part of the skill. And then you add on. And so I've taken that, um, I, you know, I took that to heart 
and and I started to think about how how cornering should should work, and using using the principles from downhill skiing, the primary principle is what's called angulation, where you 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 are very conscious of where you're putting your weight, mm-hmm. of, and you know, on on the bike, just like skiing, uh, you 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 actually have you know the bottom of your body is angled and the top, top of your body is is essentially vertical. Right. And as you're going from side to side, the bottom of your body angles, but your upper body stays vertical. I mean, I, I know we're on a podcast, so it may be a little bit hard to describe, but. If, if you're on the YouTube version, you can see Alex's hands as it makes more sense. There you go. <laughs> and, you know, I developed this, this sort of, this, this way of, of thinking and, you know, uh, you know, I, I applied it to myself personally. Um, and I, I think maybe I was able to come to it from, you know, that kind of non-cycling perspective, mm-hmm. because I started cycling, not as a cyclist, but as a hockey player. Okay. Right. I came to cycling relatively late when I was 16. A lot of, a lot of people grew up in cycling families, you know, and, and, is, is, you know, especially nowadays, and, you know, they don't really do other sports. They start with cycling, but I came to cycling from hockey and I wanted to, you know, just get in shape you know, to be a better hockey player. And then cycling took over. Uh, again, by osmosis is I, I never had the goal to be a professional cyclist, but I just got every year just kept getting, uh, it kept getting better. Um, but because it came from that, from that non-cycling world, I think I was able to be more open to other ideas, mm-hmm. you know, and other ways of, 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 you know, improving cornering technique. So uh, being able to, you know, to apply those techniques and made me a much better uh, descender cornering specialist uh and still today you know i look i watch some of the um the pros who are racing now that some of them are horrible descenders <laughs> absolute and these are the best pros like yeah. pogachar pogachar in the in the uh, tour last year on one of those time trials you know he was co- doing it he was cornering on a on a descent you know completely opposite instead of having his weight on the outside of the bike and pressuring the outside pedal. He was trying to lean his shoulders into the corner and the bikes mm. over, you know, and you know, there's no weight on his outside foot. So, you know, the, the, there was no pressure holding the tires to the ground. Like he was doing it completely wrong, but I'm sure no one ever, no one has ever taught that because he didn't, you know, he, he didn't, you know, it depends where you, where you grow up, which club you belong to and who teaches mm. you the skills. Right. And there's no, there's no book, no manual for that. Right. Versus downhill skiing. Everyone learns how to corner or turn mm-hmm. properly on their downhill skis, whether you're a racer or a recreational skier. Right. Anyway, that, uh, that I'll jump off my uh, soapbox. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> so I'm thinking about, um, Pogchar and in that, in that example, I'm thinking about like, I wonder too, if it's, I see this with running sometimes and a case of like somebody does so well, it's like, if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know what I mean? Right. But then I always go, yeah, but could we make it better? Exactly. (laughs) So I think that's a tough, that's, and that's a tough balance to have because, um, oh gosh, why did I just forget? Um, uh, Tim Don pro pro, former pro triathlete. He runs like a, goofy mofo like it's uh, apologies tim he is fast as all get out I, yeah. I'm absolutely super fast as i could ever be but his running form is bonkers but yeah. people they, they just let him go because he's so fast it's like well why why screw with it right um you're talking about downhill skiing and talking about teaching skills that made me think about another another conversation i had um with uh two-time olympian doug lewis who's a downhill ski racer he has a camp um where he tries to teach, like, he, he doesn't teach downhill ski skills specifically. And if you want to listen to that episode, he'll talk, he talks about it more, episode 102. But, I, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously, because it's been months and months since I talked to Doug. It, he talks about, like, they do all kinds of, like, random drills and stuff in his attempt to basically teach, like, instant adaptability Hmm. so you encounter a situation you've never been in before you can't necessarily rely on 
that perfect like muscle memory of like well, I make a right turn and make a left turn, like something weird happens. Yeah. And then having the adaptability to deal with that moment without thinking about it is like what he's after teaching. So are you talking about different philosophies and, you know, not being necessarily a exact prescribed uh, train of thought for teaching like cornering or descending and cycling maybe maybe definitely think about Doug, especially when you mentioned the, the downhill ski racing. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, in, in my skills camps, for instance, I'll, I'll teach agility on the bike mm -hmm. where, you know, so that you are used to, you're, you're not used to just sitting in one place on the bike all the time. Mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're, 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 you get, you need to get used to doing, you know, being on the bike as if, um, you know, as if it's, 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 it's part of your life, you know, the bike and you are one. So, you know, uh, putting water bottle, water bottles on the ground, I do it on the grass actually. And then getting people to, as they're riding past the bottle, pick the bottle up. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, and then if you get better at that, then put, then put the bottle down without having it tip over while mm -hmm. you're still riding, right. Loop around, pick it up again, yeah, do it on both sides. Right. And it's, it's tough when you're not used to doing it. It's tough. Right. Or um, just, just the, the idea of, uh, being in a, you know, riding side by side beside someone and being able to look back, say, look, is that, look for traffic or you, you know, maybe you have to, you know, switch off the front. Well, how do you do that without deviating from your line? Right. Right. And, and just all those little things that, that help you be, become a more well-rounded, uh, you know, rider that uh, lets you adapt. I think and that's a good word, you know, that to adapt to different situations and, you know, what, you know, when, when that dog runs out in front of you. Oh, oh the dog. Right. How, how many tours have we watched where a dog takes out the Peloton? Like, well, you know, and, but what you don't see is how many times it happens on training rides. Right. Cause there's no cameras. Right. Right. And to tell you what, it happens a lot. Yeah. Those, those crazy dogs that run out from people's yards. And, uh, you know, we used to have, you used to have the frame pumps that fit in the frame, mm -hmm. right? Now everyone has a mini pump, but back then we had a frame pump and, you know, we had, there was two prongs. There's on still the one attached to my dad's bike. Don't worry. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> so uh, there used to be, uh, prongs on the end of the, of the pump. Mm -hmm. And we actually sharpened those ends. They used to be metal. He, Campy actually made one that was a metal metal. End, and then we, sh we sharpened those two ends. So when the dog came, we could, we could beat off the dog with a pokey stick, you know, that, <laughs> but you know, those situations are so unpredictable and it creates such chaos. Just if, even if there's like six of you riding along, yeah. the dog runs out, how do you react? Right. And, and, and does everyone do the right thing at the right time? How, and you know, how do you train for that? Right. It's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's going back to that, you know, repetition and being on the bike for so many hours you know once you've got ten thousand hours in right you you you, you finally become an expert at, at doing that right yeah <laughs> at reacting properly but it's it's definitely tough to to uh to to uh train people to react appropriately yeah in those, in those kind of emergency situations yeah yeah, yeah. You, you you talk about the skills you work on with your your skills course um, made me think about, you know, when I was watching the tour more, uh, more regularly, definitely the, like, there's so much time to, my dad likes watching the scenery, but I actually like watching the race. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so I always think about, I ride when I ride, I'm basically riding solo. Like I've done group rides on a very rare occasion, but, and then, uh, as trying to become a, pro triathlon i was fortunate to to get to work on some drafting skills for some of the draft legal format amateur right. stuff that's available and it's very different i mean just the thing i think is taken for granted by the like the average viewer that doesn't know anything about cycling is how tight it seems like everybody is in the peloton like you're talking about those skills of looking around not running into other people like how tight the tires are you know front to back Yep. And then I always felt like uh, the food and water stops were amazing. Like how is it just, you know, they're going by 25 miles an hour, grab a water bottle without blinking and continuing on their way. I'm like, how does that not like throw you off your center of gravity? And I, you know, practice obviously, but just, I think some of that minutia is like the appreciation for it gets lost because you don't necessarily understand 
how I'll say difficult, but just like compared to average Joe's capabilities, how like difficult some of those even like everyday easy occurrences are. Yeah. And, you know, and for when, when you're in the race and you, you've done this so many times over and over, um, you know, it, it becomes, it becomes second nature because, you know, as, as an amateur rider, you don't necessarily, you know, do those feed zone uh, situations as an amateur rider because most of the races aren't long enough. Right. So you start doing that as, you know, later on in your, in your cycling career. Um, but you, you soon realize, you know, there's, there's, there's a proper way to do it. But again, no one's actually teaching that. You have to just learn by osmosis mm -hmm. and by watching. And, you know, let's say, you know, in a feed zone, there's some unwritten rules as well. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, you learn to you know, look ahead and you see, okay, you're looking for your soigneur with your musette bags, right. but in front of you is a guy, you know, a, another racer, but his soigneur is ahead of your soigneur. So you, you need to go to the outside of that, of that exchange so that you don't get in the way of their pickup. And then you can go and get your pickup ahead of, you know, ahead of the guy in front of you. And it, 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 it it's it's not obvious when you're watching on TV how that works, mm -hmm. but there's these unwritten rules, right? That you that you need to follow, and that everyone you know stays safe. And if you don't, if you don't follow that rule, if you get in the way, you know, one of the senior guys in the peloton will talk to the road captain from your team. You say, hey, you know, your guy there didn't really didn't didn't really do the right thing there. So then your road captain then comes down and in the race, this is all happening in the race, yeah. comes and talks to you and says, next time, make sure you're on the other side when, you know, when the feed's happening, because, you know, you got in the way of that guy, right? There's a real, there's this, 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 this protocol that happens that, that is quite, it's quite interesting. Of course, you don't see a lot of that on TV. I mean, no one really talks about it, but there's definitely this, this, this hierarchy, mm -hmm. right? And you learn, you know, hopefully you can learn, you know, b b before you, uh, you know, cause a big crash or crash yourselves. But unfortunately, you know, uh, it, some, some, some good riders end up crashing and, and, you know, ruining the careers yeah. because they just aren't able, you know, they, they didn't do the right thing at the right time, or they haven't, they weren't able to learn along the way. Um, and um, yeah, they had to, just, yeah, to stop being, uh, you know, they, they weren't able to continue their career because of a, of a career, ending, career, uh, career ending crash. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's a weird sport. <laughs> There's <laughs> lots of, lots of nuances uh, that you need to pick up on. Um, and uh, you know, that I know that, you know, the teams are trying to do a better job nowadays of helping their young talent develop, mm. you know, not just with the training, but you know, with all these, these, these protocols as well. So they can prepare them to be, uh, you know, a, a you know, a, a better professional. So I, I want to ask you. In I, I've been trying to figure this out. So th this question is going to come out as I don't know what I'm talking about, and that's precisely why I'm asking it. Um, so I want to ask you about. It, it seemed like I'll make an assumption. You'll tell me I'm wrong, and then I'll, I'll learn, and that's how I'm going to do this. It seemed like you're pretty solid at some of the like short time trial stuff. So, but then obviously you're riding tours. Why didn't you say, oh, I'm just going to ride like velodrome and I'm just going to ride track. Like what I, you probably did a little of both. So I guess, can you yep. talk to me about maybe the differences or why you chose to go with the longer stuff versus say, you know, being like a track specialist? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's actually a natural progression. I'll okay. put it that way. Track cycling you know, and I'll say this every time on, uh, you know, to anyone track cycling is the basis for all cycling. When, when you grow up racing on the track, you learn so many things as a junior, as a U 23 rider. Um, you know, it's, it's very intense, uh, but you, it teaches you to pedal properly with a smooth pedal stroke because you, you can't change gears. It's a fixed gear. So mm -hmm. you have, if you want to go faster, you have to pedal faster right? That's just how it is. Um, you learn how to, how to uh, time your sprint properly, how to come off a wheel, how to stay and follow a draft. Cause the faster the speeds go, the, you know, the more draft the effect there is because it's mm -hmm. exponential. 
Um, so you learn to be super efficient. You learn how to handle your, yourself in a really tight group because track cycling is all about staying in, in, in a pack until the right moment. Uh, you know, there's just so many things, you know, and, but you, you know, to, to be a track specialist for the rest of your life, you know, if, if you're in a, if you're in the, the short distance track events like sprint, then yes, certainly. Yeah. That that's something you can do and make a living from possibly by, you know, racing six days and, and, you uh, know, you know, track in the winter and all those things. But as an endurance track cyclist, which I was, you know, uh, it, the, the natural progression was to, was to race road. And, and that's, that's where you could earn a living okay. as, as a cyclist was on the road. However, it was an interesting, you know, situation for me, you know, you know, starting as a hockey player, developing anaerobic power, not really developing the, you know, the long distance, um, uh, you know, um, abilities with, you know, aerobic power. And, and, you know, when I went to Europe, you know, and, and we started racing over 200 kilometers, I just, I really didn't feel like I was able to, to adapt to that, that, you know, that time in the saddle and the distance. Um, so fortunately for me at that time, uh, our, our sponsor 7-Eleven also wanted riders, you know, to race in the U S and Canada in the shorter races, criteriums, shorter road races, short state, you know, stage races that weren't mm -hmm. nearly as long. And that, that was a perfect fit for me. You know, I could race in Europe and, you know, you know, I could, I could be useful for the team in the first, you know, 200 K, but if it went to 250 K, that was really another level that I wasn't really hadn't, you know, adapted to. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, you know, as, as a professional, the best thing to do would be to help my sponsor, you know, by, by racing in the U S and Canada. So I ended up, you know, in the last you know years of my career racing more in the U S and Canada, because that's what I was better at. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, you know, as far as, as I go through life, you start, you start to realize, you know, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? You know, admit that you have weaknesses. Not everyone's going to be great at everything. Mm -hmm. And what, where's the best place to apply those strengths, All right? As a cyclist, that's what I did. As a business professional, that's what I do as well, right? I love hunting for, for new opportunities. I hate farming, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, going into an account and saying, okay, well, we did a good job for you here. Maybe I can, you know, can we do something else for you that would be really valuable, you know? And what are your challenges, you know? That's just boring, <laughs> You know, I want something new and exciting to work on, right? So, you know, if realize that of your of myself uh, was really a, a sort of a, you know, an aha moment, right? And I think, oh yeah, that's what I love, right? So, uh, and uh, been able to sort of craft my career that way as as time goes on. What's the saying? It's like uh, horses for courses. You know, figuring out you yeah. know what your lane is. Yeah. I think sometimes as a a young person that assuming you didn't like you mentioned earlier maybe grew up in a cycling family or kind of inherited a certain discipline yeah. especially in north america we like kids have so many different sports and options to choose from yeah i think sometimes it can be difficult to to hone down on one especially because like this this mentality of competing all year and so many different things is so pervasive that sometimes it's like maybe you love things equally but you're a little better than at one and it's i think it's hard maybe i'm just speaking and projecting here but it's, it's hard to give up something and say no i really think i am better at this other thing just you know by a little bit and you know i can have more success then that's that's going to be more fun <clears throat> it, it i don't know it's just the the paradox of choice sometimes i think is difficult especially when again, coming back to like living with uncertainty, you don't necessarily know where you're going and are you going to have success? Yeah. So, it's, you know, you can never predict all those things, you know, I, and I, I, you know, with, with, you know, I've got two kids, um, they're, they're now in their you know, late twenties, early thirties. And we, we always said to them, you know, you can do one thing at a time, one sport, you know, uh, one, one activity, but you know, we didn't want to be the parents that were driving our kids from one activity to the next, to the next, to the next. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, in the winter, you know, our son played hockey, right. In the summer we were, we were bike riding, but it wasn't like we were doing all these other things to try to like, Oh, give him the full experience. No, just, right. just, you know, 
keep, you know, it, it, otherwise you just run around with your head cut off and, and you never really get to learn, you know, a particular skill or sport or activity. Our daughter's a really good piano player. So she took piano lessons and then it was a bit of dance as well. And boy, I tell you the dance thing started to take over because they want you to do all the other pieces of dance and not just yes. one, you know, and oh my God, it got out of hand. Right. Um, and, you know, I also coach uh, our, our local cycling club here in Edmonton, Alberta, the Juventus Cycling Club, um, not you know, loosely affiliated to Juventus in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Italy, the soccer club. Yeah, I had uh, wondered about that. I was like, I was like, where's the cadet house? I'll try to figure that out. It took me. Well, we, uh, we actually also have a soccer club here in Edmonton. And uh, the event of soccer club that we're we're affiliated with as well, cycling and soccer because that's big in Italy, of course. Yeah, too, but right. Um, but with these with these kids, eleven to fourteen year olds, you know, I really impress upon them that you know it's important to do other sports, other activities, not just cycling. Yeah, let's let's do cycling. Let's you know when, when we're doing it, we're you know we're having fun. Show I'm teaching them the skills, but you know you know do your volleyball, do your school volleyball or club volleyball if you have to or triathlon or anything else. And, you know, when, you know, as you get older, they'll, they end up gravitating to a, what they are good at. And usually because they're good at it, they're enjoying it. Mm -hmm. Right. So they end up gravitating to the place that they want to be. And that's just fine. It doesn't have to be cycling, but at least I know I'm giving them a foundation to be a lifelong cyclist. And that doesn't mean they're going to be a bike racer you know, but be able mm -hmm. to learn how to ride a bike properly and handle yourself in a group and, you know, be able to just jump on a bike and go and, and know what to do when you're riding. To me, that's, you know, teaching that lifelong skill is, is the most important thing. I always find it interesting how former pros approach their children in, in terms of, you know, deciding yeah. or not deciding to pass on skills, right? Because, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I, I think there's this in our mind, or my mind, maybe I don't, maybe our cultural mind, but at least my mind, um, there's this like image of, you know, former pro athlete, and then they're just gonna like drill their kids to be the next pro, like like you right. know, continuing their career vicariously through their children. But as far as all of the pros I've talked to in the last four years, at least to me none of them have espoused that philosophy in the slightest. The, the, you know, similarly yeah. to you, it's like, uh, you know, I talked to uh, um, Olympic hurdler, Toyin Augustus, and she talked about her daughter. She's like, you know, we, we've gone to the track, I've taught her hurdling skills, like, because she's, you know, expressed some interest, but it, she's not like grooming her to be the, day, you know, the right. next Olympic champion. Yeah. It, it, it seems really consistent. And, it kind of makes me wonder where yeah. that, you know, in my mind, where that idea came from of like pros continuing their career through their children, where it, you know, has to be that way. Cause it doesn't really seem to be a reality. Yeah. I think, I think it's mostly the, you know, the, the, uh, the ex pros generally, I think have a better perspective on, on life with their, for their kids, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, high performance adults, you know, you know, you know, it never quite were good at, you know, enough to be a pro right. and they're living vicariously through their kids. Okay. And, you know, my, my son, you know, I was a hockey coach for my son's minor hockey team throughout his, his minor hockey life. And um, boy, you, you saw parents who were definitely trying to, 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 you know, live through their kids. Right. And their, you know, their kid was going to be the next hockey pro and boy, uh, that was tough to watch and, and listen to, because you could hear them from, as you're on the bench coaching the team, you can hear the parents yelling from the stands, mm -hmm. right? Like, gosh, you guys, what, what are you, what are you thinking? Yeah. And those poor kids, right? yeah. to, you know, and my rule was, you know, with, with our son, uh, you know, we, we drove to the game together, you know, and then, and then after the game, we of course drive home. And my rule was, I didn't talk about the game, about what happened unless he brought it up. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not all about recapping all the things that happened and how you could have improved and all this crap. Right. Don't even go there. Yeah. That, that just now just burns in this, this feeling of, Oh my God, I got to get in the car with dad and hear about all this shit that happened and you know, all the mistakes <laughs> I made and all the opportunities I missed. Like, no, no, don't yeah. go there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, 
hopefully I'll make this short because we're starting to run down on time. Do mm-hmm. you think that that trying to live vicariously through their kids, do you think that's like the fallacy of thinking like them projecting themselves? If I had just worked harder, I, then I could have been, and then they're pushing that on their kids. Like, Oh, if you just work harder than you can be, do you <laughs> think it's that? I, I think there's an element of that. I think it's more about, you know, I, I'm going to give my kid all the opportunity that I never had because I can afford it now because, mm-hmm. you know, you can. So it's, it's power skating. It's doing the extra dry land training. It's this, it's that, you know, and, and because, uh, well, I, I, I didn't, I, you know, the power skating wasn't around when I grew up and my mm-hmm. parents couldn't afford that, but I can afford it, you know, so I'm going to get my kids to do all these extra things. Right. And all of a sudden it, you know, they're, they're 12, <laughs> right? Cause the Bantam draft is coming up uh, when they're 14. Mm-hmm. If you don't get drafted in the Bantam draft, well, there's no hope. Mm-hmm. So now you've got to, you know, you're, go- you're working backwards from there going, okay, here's the goal kids, you know, yeah. get drafted. And, you know, and of course they don't get drafted in the Bantam draft and they feel like a failure. Yeah. Right. Even though the parents, push them is, you know, with all these different activities and they don't feel like they're pushing them because, Oh, we're just dropping them off for power skating. Oh yeah. Cause you're not involved in all the, all the work. Right. Like, wrong. You're, you know, anyway, so, you know, I, 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 there's, there's an element of, you know, let's provide opportunities for kids in my mind, but there's also an element of, you know, they've got to develop at their own pace mm-hmm. and it's mental as well as physical. Then every, every, you know, it's been proven time again with child psychology and, and sports, every kid will develop at a different pace mm-hmm. mentally and physically. You've seen kids who are super strong, you know, you know, when, when they're very young, but mentally they're not strong. Right. And so you think, oh, this kid's going to be an amazing athlete, but they don't have the ability to focus and, and, um, and learn those techniques because they're mm-hmm. not mature enough yet. Right. Right. Where you see the, you know, the, the skinny kid, you know, and I've seen this at, at our cycling club, you know, the, the super skinny kid, you know, you never think, well, that kid, he couldn't be a good cyclist. He's so, you know, he's so frail, but he listens mm-hmm. and applies everything that you describe. And he's so good at that, at practicing that technique that he is better. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I've seen this in, in pro cycling too. Like, you know, the guys who are super strong naturally generally haven't learned how to be a good technical rider racer. You know, I think of John Tomac. And if you remember John Tomac, he used to be a really mm-hmm. good mountain bike racer. Anyways, his son, Eli is now, uh, you know, a supercross racer, but John was a, you know, so he thought, Hey, if I could race road, that would help my mountain biking. Okay, great. But when he raced road for Seven Eleven for a, maybe a year or two, but he, he couldn't learn how to how to sit on a wheel and conserve energy it was always in the wind i'm like jt in the on the wheel on the wheel he couldn't understand that that was going to save him energy to get you know to the end of the race or the for the next day and you're you know you're always looking to be efficient and he was super strong he could hold himself in the wind and ride with everyone else even though we're on the wheel he'd be out in the wind he could hold there but because he was so strong he didn't have to learn how to be efficient Mm -hmm. Right. So there's these, it's a really interesting uh, dynamic, you know, that I, that I, that I've witnessed over the years. Yeah. Alex, I don't want you to be late for your next one. So I have a question I'm asking everybody. I ask a single question for an entire season to all my guests. And so I'll ask you this year's question is how do you celebrate your wins? Um, well, yeah, whether it's an athletic win or a business win, you know, um, it, that's a great question. And, you know, I, I usually like to celebrate a win with the team that helped me get there. You can never, ever forget that, you know, it, it's, you know, whatever you're doing, it's a team sport. You know, even if it's an individual sport that you're in, there's a team behind that individual, you know, you know supporting them, getting them there, whether it's your family, your coaches, the, you know, the mechanic, the swanure, the, you know, that it's, a, you have to bring that team together to celebrate. And in business, it's the same. You've got people behind the scenes, a sales guy gets the win, but it's the people behind the scenes 
that are that are making it all happen. You know, without those people, there's no way you'd get that win. So trying to get together, you know, it's and it's tougher, of course, in the in COVID times to get that team together. But even if it's a you know a group call and you make time to to thank people and and um, give them kudos in front of their peers, um, that's 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 what matters. Actually, that's a really solid answer. Um, Alex, if people want to catch up with you, see what you're up to, any of that kind of stuff, where can they find you? Yeah, probably best to go to my website, stedacycling.com. So it's S-T-I-E-D-A cycling.com. Um, go to my blog. That's where I keep uh, sort of keep an updated uh, you know, list of where, what, you know, what's been happening. You know, I recently uh, got over prostate cancer. I had prostate cancer surgery, August of 2021. Um, it all happened really fast. And, uh, I had a radical prostatectomy, which means, you know, removing the prostate, um, with this really cool robot technology, <laughs> you have to look it up. It's amazing. Um, and, uh, six months, you know, two months later, I, I had another PSA test and I have a clean bill of health, no, no cancer. So I feel so, so fortunate to be in this situation. You know, I'm going to be 61 this year. Um, and then, you know, I've had the prostate removed, which, you know, there's some side effects, but, you know, I'd rather have that than, you know, have cancer in my body. And, right. you know, when you, when you hear the stories about other people who have, you know, cancer and that they are, they're not, you know, it's not as easy for them to get over the cancer. You know, I, I almost feel guilty that it's been, it's happened so well for me, but my final thought is I've got a blog there about my cancer. Uh, going off on a tangent here, sorry, but uh, my, my, my message is to all the men out there over 40, get tested every year for prostate cancer. Obviously, you're going to get a, you know, you should get a, um, you know, you get your GP to check you over anyways with your annual physical, but get the PSA test, the PSA blood test, and ask also for the finger test. It's very uncomfortable having someone stick a finger inside you, but that's how my GP found my prostate cancer by feeling a lump on my prostate. Mm -hmm. My PSA number wasn't very high. So ask for both, get both, get it done every year. And early detection is the key. Well, appreciate the, uh, the public service announcement, I guess. <laughs> That's right. um, but I'm glad you're doing well. And uh, Alex, thanks for hanging out with me. You're welcome, Jesse. My pleasure.